Hello all, thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Andy Wingo, uh, and this talk is about compiling to WebAssembly. WebAssembly as a target archer architecture for compilers. Uh, in this talk, we're going to have a little hands-on intro to WebAssembly, um, and we, then we're going to proceed to write a tiny scheme compiler. Uh, we're going to talk about the bits that we can't get to in the live coding part. And then we're going to mention the different kinds of questions that you will need to answer if you're considering targeting WebAssembly from your language. And if you'd like to follow along, there is a GitHub repository uh, with all the supporting information that you might need. So, to be concrete, let's take the simple scheme program, uh, the recursive factorial, and we would like to look to try to compile this to WebAssembly. Now, when I work on a compiler, I like to think about what kind of code I would like the source term to residualize to. So, in this case, I need to think about what should the WebAssembly look like um, for that's the result of compiling the recursive factorial. And uh, happily, WebAssembly is defined in such a way that has a standardized text format that corresponds exactly to the binary, uh, whereas uh, the binary is WASM, though the text format is called WAT. It's implemented using uh, S expressions, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and it's a, a bunch of sections in the file. We don't need to actually touch on all of these for this example. Uh, we're just going to look at types, functions, and uh, export sections. So, um, if we switch over to the editor here, uh, start my module, module. Um, first, I got to think about the types, right? So, what's what's the type of factorial? Tfac. We'll give it a name. These things with the dollar signs in front of them is just a a name for the purposes of the text format. It's not actually used. Uh, it's not reified in the binary. Uh, it's just a a nicety. So, the factorial function takes one parameter. It's a number. Well. WebAssembly only has four different data types as I32, I64, F32, F64, and that's it. So we have to figure out how to express our program using these, this paltry set of, of primitives. Um, in this case, we're going to have one parameter, which is an I32, and one result, which is an I32. You can have as many results as you like, as many parameters as you like. Um, web browsers commonly in, uh, put some restrictions on these, um, like you can only have up to, I don't know, a thousand parameters or a hundred thousand parameters or something. Uh, but in practice it's not really a limitation. Okay, so when I go to write the function for factorial, again I give it a name, um, it has type tfac, meaning it has one parameter and one result. The incoming parameter will be mapped to local variable number zero. If I had more locals I could declare them here, like i32, i32. That would mean a total of three locals, including the parameter. But in this case, we don't actually need a local variable. Uh, so if I look at the uh, source program, uh, I need to start by doing this if. Um, and WebAssembly is a strange machine. Uh, it, it doesn't have go-to. Uh, although it has a nested if-then-else, it's not very useful. The, the generic, the general uh, control flow primitive has is, is blocks and conditional breaks. Uh, so a block is essentially a, a, a region of code which is also a jump target. You can jump to a block. There are essentially two kinds of blocks, not counting the if-then-else. Uh, there's a block and a loop, and if you jump to a block, you end up jumping to the end of the block. And if you jump to a loop, and this is a loop that has to be sort of in scope to the jump, then you jump to the beginning of the loop. And, and that's all you have. So in this case of, of my if, I'm going to go, I'm going to make one block, block, call it b1, um, and then uh, blocks have a, a type. They have a number of incoming values on the stack, and then they have a number of outgoing values on the stack. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to have this block to um, have no incoming values, because there are no incoming values at the start of the program, uh, at the start of the function. And I'll just let its its one value flow out to be the return value of the function, um, and I could I could give a name to that uh, type tb1. Uh, a block type is essentially a function type, so it has no parameters and it has one result. 
and so type db1. There are some shorthands for uh, block types which uh, are, only have one or zero uh, return values. I'll just write them out in full here. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so now I'm in, in block tb1. This is going to be one one arm of the if, and I need another block to be the other arm of the if. So it, inside these two statements, um, but in this case, I'm not going to actually flow out a value. We'll see why in a minute. Uh, this will be tb2 with no parameters and results. Okay. Uh, I think you're getting the feeling that WebAssembly is a little bit of a weird machine. So look back again at the... Uh, with the factorial program, I say if zero, if n is zero. So first I have to get n, because it's a stack machine. And I do that by doing local.get zero, because the parameter n is the first parameter, thus index zero. Uh, and there is an instruction called i32.xz, which pops the top of the stack and pushes a one if the top of the stack was zero, and pushes a zero otherwise. Um, and then I use br if, uh, so if the, which pops the top of the stack, and if it's non-zero, it will jump to the target, in this case, b2. So if the top of the stack is non-zero, jump to b2. What does it mean to jump to b2? It means to jump to the end of block b2. That's, uh, that's how blocks work. If you jump to them, control flow continues at the end. So here, after b2, Let's imagine I'm doing the, um, the then branch of the if, which is 1. So i32.const1. That's how you make a, a constant web assembly. And then this value will simply flow out of the block. It will flow out of, of block b1. Uh, it will flow out, in fact, to be the return value of the function. So we've implemented the then side of, of the if. Now we have to implement the else side. Uh, so, let's see, times n, so first let's evaluate n, local dot zero, that's n, and then minus n1, okay, so local dot get zero again, i32 dot const one, i32 dot sub. You see this is uh, like the old calculators, it was reverse Polish notation. Um, so i32.sub will pop two things from the stack and push the deepest one minus the shallow one. So now we have our two values on the stack and uh, we are going to call fac. Um, and as you see, as a compile target, uh, WebAssembly uh, doesn't have uh, unstructured go to. It also doesn't have unstructured uh, stack access. There's no stack pointer that's accessible to you. There's no link register, program counter, any of that. You can't even, um, you know, alias the stack to anything and, and walk the stack. This is what you have. Once we call the factorial, we're going to need to multiply. So this, this one stays on stack over the call. So i32.mul, which will multiply the two. And here, recall that the type of this block has no results. So I just need to, the, I, I could I could branch, uh, I could actually uh, br2, so not to zero, not to block zero in depth, and not to block one in depth, but actually to block two in depth, because the function makes a, an implicit block. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to say return, which effectively does the same. It will branch to the outermost block. Um, that's my uh, that's my function. I simply need to export it uh, to to the um, to the whoever loads WebAssembly because WebAssembly is uh, is something that you embed. Right. So we have our uh, program here. I hope it type checks. Let's move over to our terminal. Uh, and we can do uh, wat to wasm uh, This is a utility from the Wabit project. W-A-B-T. Uh, wat to wasm fact.wat. Hmm. 
And what so the, the problem is is that uh, they they used the spirit of S expressions, but they didn't actually use the reality. So some things like comments, like you would use in Scheme, they don't actually work. Uh, so I remove my my comment, and I see I got no errors. And uh, as you can see, the WASM file is 67 bytes, uh, which is kind of nice. I can give this a test by I have a little HTML file that will load up the the WASM file. So I need to make a little web server. Python uh, m hp dot server uh, Python three dash m hp okay so now I'm running a little web server I can go to my web browser not that web browser um, one moment right this web browser I open up my HTML page oh I'm getting some errors fac is not a function you know what I think I need to go back to my Emacs. I actually export it using the wrong name. I export the function as fac. Back to my terminal. Wat wasm. Restart my web server. Back to my web browser. Reload. Excellent. Got some factorials. Fac 30. Fac 31. Fac 32. Oh, it's negative. That's right. We're using i32 values. Funny. Um, so we have our desired WebAssembly. It's small. Um, let's see how we can uh, use Scheme to produce this. But again, uh, here's a link to the Wabbit uh, utility, which um, provides this wet wasm uh, code. Let's work on making a simple compiler from Scheme to WebAssembly. All right. So if we look at um, at the the program we're compiling, Factorial, uh, it has we're going to need to scan uh, all the forms in the file for definitions and uh, we will transform them into a set of types, functions, and exports. For simplicity we'll just export each top-level function. Uh, as we WebAssembly being a stack-based language it's quite convenient to just traverse the body of the function uh, just in a direct fashion um, and we'll need to record types as we see them. So. We'll open a new file, compile.scm. Um, use mod. We'll load up a pattern matching facility. And uh, here we go. Uh, define compile port. So we're going to read our forms from a port. Um, and at the end of the, the compile program somewhere, we're going to say uh, loop through the forms that come in on uh, on the port and unless it's an EOF object compile form form uh, and and then continue so we'll, we'll loop until we're done there and as you can see this is an imperative loop uh, I will just define my types as a little list which I'll be adding to as I go and same for the funks and the exports. And then when I'm all done, uh, I'm going to make a module. I'll add to the types uh, in the beginning. So I'll reverse them when I write them into the final form. Reverse types, reverse funks, and reverse exports. And if I load up Pretty print. And I should be able to pretty print this form. Okay. Um, so now I just have to implement, implement uh, compile form, right? And if I do a, some pattern matching on the form, it starts with define. It has a function name, it has some args, and it has a body. So first thing I will let's see here. Add func f. What's the type of the function? We're going to have to add this type as we go. Uh, we'll assume. Um, well, let's see. In turn type. Now what what is the type of 
of the function. How many arguments does it get? What what? How do we choose to represent them? How many return values does it have? How many, how are we going to represent that? Uh, we're, we'll just say map arg type over our args. Arg is going to be a list. And then for the result, let's assume we just return a single value. Um, but the single value is going to be an i32. As you say, simple compiler. Define arg type arg. What's arg type? Also i32. No big deal. Um, so that's going to be the type of the function. Um, and then for the body, the issue is, is that this is a this is a classic recursive problem. We need to scan for what definitions they are and then visit the uses of those definitions. So I'm going to delay uh, the compilation of the body by simply putting inside a lambda. Compile. And we can compile it in an environment. The incoming arguments define a set of local uh, local variables that we can use. Uh, so we will turn the arguments to an environment. And we'll also add this function as an export. Um, using what name? Symbol string f, so vac, like, like that. Uh, and what identifier? Uh, f. And that is our compile form. Uh, what about args to env? Um, how are we going to represent represent our environment? What we essentially need is a map from name to index of local variable um, that we can add on to very easily. We are simply just going to reverse that list, uh, seeing how many times looking for the the value in the list and then how long the tail is after that. Uh, we'll see how we use that a little bit later. Actually we can define that now. Look up local um, in, in an environment match memq local and memq searches for a value in a list and returns the head of the list at which it's found. So the last one will have no tail, the length of the tail is zero. The next last one will have the length of the tail is one. And that's how we'll, we'll uh, find our, do our mappings from names to numbers. Great. Um, so now what's left to do? In turn type, let's give that a, a bang. In turn type. So we have params and results. The type that we are going to reify, we might as well just um, make it right now. Type param params result. This is the uh, wat that we will residualize to the file. But if we see a certain type twice, we might as well uh, not look for it again. So. Um, If match member key types, meaning if we see the type in the list, then we will return the index. Um, otherwise, the, the index is the length of types. set, so imperative, set types, const type types, let's say not key, let's use type here, and return the index, and turn type, okay, so in turn type is going to give us an index into the types of this module. I think what's remaining is uh, add export and compile exp. Let's go ahead and take care of the export now. Uh, 
we are simply going to do a, a similar constant to the beginning of the list. Set exports cons export name func, uh, but we, we need to get a, an index for the function. So um, look up func id. We're going to const that to exports. And we don't need it. We don't care about the return value. Uh, it's for, uh, might as well make this other lookup lookup local. Lookup func. Um, And if it head is a func with a name with that ID and followed by something or other with a tail. If the ID equals F, then it's the length of funks similar to before. Otherwise, occur on funks. And if we get to, if it doesn't match, it means we've run out of the list and we're actually looking up a, an unbound variable. Whew. Um, does that mat match what we actually pushed onto the func list in the add funks? Form. We haven't actually implemented add func. That's the issue. So well, we get an ID, we get a type index, and we get a body. So set funks cons func ID type type index and the body, which is a lambda at this point, so we're consing that on to funks. Great. I think at this point we have everything we need to go into compile exp, and this is kind of the meat of the thing. Um, Alright, so I'm compiling the expression, as you know, we go back to fact.scm. Uh, we have, what are the different kinds of expressions we have? We have a uh, call to zero, we have uh, constants, we have lexical references, we have calls to top level procedures, we have procedures like minus, and we have an if. Uh, so we're going to have to match on these different expression kinds. Um, match on expression. Um, so, first of all, is it a, what if it's just a symbol? In that case, it's probably a local variable, uh, so we're going to say local get lookup local id. Um, we are actually going to, uh, be because each expression in the source language can com compile to a number of expressions in the target, we're going to, each, each one of these compilers is going to return a list. Uh, that way we'll be able to produce the WAT format more easily. Uh, what if the expression is a number? Uh, more specifically, an exact integer. We can use i32.const, as we uh, said before. Okay. What if uh, the expression is an if? If test, then else. Okay, as we showed before, we are going to use uh, a block uh, whose type is, in turn, type. We have a bit of imperativeness in, in, the, in the heart here. In turn, type of uh, nothing incoming but i32 outgoing. Um, and how do we start? We start with another block inside it. 
in turn type nothing incoming and nothing outgoing. So having set up our, our two different jump targets, we can return refer to the closest one as, as jump target zero, and then the one that's one step out is jump target one. Um, we compile the dot at splats in multiple expressions, splices them in. We um, can compile in the test and uh, then in our case we are going to uh, br if zero. So if the test is true then we will jump to the innermost block. Um, otherwise we will continue with the else part of the test. Um, and that we can be our uh, one, which would effectively th this would this would be the same as the return, but instead we we could do a return here instead. Uh, I know we don't want to do a return because we don't know where the tail part of the function. So br one. So the, this whole expression ends by either in this case it ends by jumping to this block and thus jumping to its end. Okay, that's the else block. Otherwise, compile then in v, and in this case it ends simply by flowing that, that one value flowing out. We have done if. Uh, we need to do just a few more. 0 exp, so compile exp n i32.exe That's the uh, we send the instruction that we residualized earlier by hand. Um, what else have we got? We got minus. In this case, we compile A and then B and I32 at sub. Um, times. In this case, it's similar. A, B, I32 mol. Um, and I think the only thing left at this point is the function call. F. Well, it has to be a symbol. We'll just say F. F. Uh, arg. Let's see. We'll compile the arguments. Then map arg. And then we call look up funk f and I think that may be our compiler uh, what are we missing uh, a pen map is not in the default environment serve v1 alright do have to fix my pen map here and the expert trying that a bit, I had to fix an invocation of lookup local, and I had to rename some invocations of from compile to compile exp, uh, but that's all done. If we take a look at the end of the file, uh, we say when we are when we're in batch mode, we'll look at the command line and uh, take the, the first argument and pass it to compile. Let's see what we get. So, uh, compile, compile, We forgot to actually recurse into the procedure, so let's go ahead and do that. So here I've fixed the, the funks list to invoke these uh, compile body funks and splice them into the body, and I had to fix a couple of other bugs. Uh, once we do that, uh, we can go to the terminal, run our gal uh, compile fact.scm, and we can see the result. Um, it looks similar to what we wrote, more or less. It doesn't have the a lot of the names in it, and if we pipe that to a file and then uh, run wat to wasm on it, we get no errors. At that point, if we switch to our web browser and uh, we refresh, 
Oh, we got no web browser running, so I'll run the Python web server. Uh, indeed, I can do FAC with 29 and everything. So, pretty cool. FAC 10. Does everything work? Okay, great. Um, so, that that is the uh, simple compiler. Um, there are a lot of things that are remaining to be done. If you take a look into the GitHub repository associated with the talk, you'll see uh, the compiler itself, um, and including a, an assembler as well, so you don't actually have to run w to WASM on the thing. It'll produce the bytes directly. I, and I would encourage you to do that, because um, it's not that much code. Uh, we're in the minimal languages room, and dependencies are, are the opposite of minimal. Uh, however, our, our, our language that we compiled doesn't include a lot. It doesn't include uh, closures and tail calls and all of that. And all of these are still, like, they're, they're, they're pretty big problems, and they're the reasons I haven't ported uh, Guile to WebAssembly at this point. Um, the only real solution today for closures is comprehensive closure conversion of your entire program so that you don't end up um, making indirect calls. Instead, you call uh, known recipients with 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 the with the values uh, as arguments um, for tail calls, uh, there's again no real replacement. There's a proposal. Uh, I've I've actually worked on it a bit in SpiderMonkey, but I had to drop it because uh, it's just not not high priority um, for a variable number of arguments. WebAssembly is a um, typed language. You can't call a function with the wrong number of arguments wrong number of arguments. You can't have a function that takes a different number of arguments, but you need to store those values somewhere in a data structure and then pass that data structure to the function. So maybe you need a shadow uh, space to pass arguments. It's it's not very nice. Threads, on the other hand, is coming along a bit more nicely. The Threads specification will probably be usable uh, uh, soon enough. But with regards to how do you ship programs in WebAssembly, you really want to do whole program compilation start to think about linking different uh, WASM modules together, um, I, I think it's not heading towards a good uh, user experience, because we're thinking about this in the web browser context mainly. Um, for exceptions, uh, you can uh, bounce through JavaScript uh, and use JavaScript's try-catch, uh, but if you're doing that, then maybe you should consider compiling to JavaScript directly instead of WebAssembly. Um, there is a proposal which is heading down the line which might be usable this year, uh, exception handling, uh, which provides the very minimum of uh, non-local control flow. But it could be extended with effect handlers which would give us uh, coroutines, one-shot um, continuations that we could use in um, different asynchronous uh, idioms. But the big problem, the big problem is GC. Um, I worked on one uh, compiler to WebAssembly schism a scheme implementation. It uses uh, i32 as its value type, but not everything is an integer. It's a tagged value. Um, and so if it's not an immediate fix num, then it's a pointer into linear memory. Uh, and you can implement your own GC, and that's fine. But the problem is you can't trace references on the stack. You can't uh, move values in linear memory and expect the stack to update to point to those new values. Uh, you have essentially no relationship with JavaScript, and JavaScript already has a fantastic garbage collector in it, in all the browsers. Uh, so th what the approach that I've taken to switching to is to, if you have a language in which you need to represent different kinds of values um, and they're all garbage collected, I would use uh, extern ref as your fundamental value uh, representation. And uh, that's the reference type specification, which hopefully again will become usable this year. Um, and, and eventually it should be possible to uh, access uh, structured, garbage collected, managed objects in WebAssembly itself, and, and there are relationships to closures. Um, there are lots more questions. What do you do about strings? It's a big problem. What do you do about access to WebGL? And there are solutions, um, and, and, and happily the, the import functionality is, is quite good. Uh, and then if you're operating on more traditional languages, there's there's a complete other tool chain that I'd be happy to talk about at some, some point as well. I work on LVM web, WebAssembly stuff as, as well. Um, and uh, do you actually take your language as it is, or do you fork it and give it some different semantics that are adapted to the platform you're, you're targeting, the web browser? Big questions. Uh, happy to answer them. I think I'm out of time. Uh, but thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, happy hacking.